I mean, I get energy by being around our people. And if our people are there and we've got great office space, so like our, our cool office vibe that you're hearing of is not limited to, you know, Des Moines or Waukee. You know, if you walked into Dallas or Minneapolis or Denver, or Kansas City, Omaha, I mean, the list goes on. They're all really great offices. And what makes them great is our people. And so when you get a chance to go in and connect with our people, the space just, you know, kind of complements the great energy that, that's there. It's time! Work! Play! I want to connect the listeners to the best of the best. Welcome to the Evolve Broker Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Costello, the co-founder and principal at Evolve MGA. Our mission for the podcast is to bring the insurance industry the best of the best. Today, I spoke with the chairman and CEO of one of the largest insurance agencies in the United States. That agency is Holmes Murphy, and Holmes Murphy is headquartered in Iowa. They have over $117 million in PNC revenue, over 750 employees in 14 locations, and they are led by Mr. Dan Keough. Dan attended University of Iowa in Loyola, Chicago, before starting a captive strategies company called ICS. He grew Holmes Murphy's Northern Division as their president before going on to become their chairman and CEO. In our conversation, we discussed Dan's personal background, how he was intro to the insurance industry, his road to becoming CEO, and Holmes Murphy today. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Varuna. Varuna is the agency management system of the future built on the number one customer relationship management tool in the world, Salesforce. Varuna allows you to customize your system, workflows, reports, and dashboards in minutes and allows you to gain actionable insights about your business in real time, letting you use this intelligence to grow your business in multiples. Varuna allows you to know your business so that you can grow your business. Please visit varuna.com to learn more. Without further ado, here's Dan. Dan, welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. I would love to get to know you better on a personal note, and I'm hoping you can kind of walk the audience through where you're from, how you grew up, uh, any interesting stories along the way. Uh, Can you start us off on the note where where you grew up? Sure. I grew up in the Chicago area, uh, western suburbs, and one of six kids in our family, Pretty traditional, you know, middle class family, um, you know, had played sports kind of growing up, uh, competitive, you know, things and uh, somehow found my way into this uh, wonderful industry called the insurance industry. <laughs> so did you play uh, sports in high school? I did. I, I played ba- basketball uh, and baseball. And then I, for fun of it, I went out for swimming and diving one season just for the fun of it. Wow. Okay. Like high dive. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very Just cool. Tried to do something different. Uh, ended up going to sectionals, which was kind of interesting. Um, it's back when the jam boxers were a big thing, and okay. I was only the one at sectionals in those long like shorts. Everyone else was in like speedos. So I was just a little too uncomfortable. <laughs> so that's awesome. That's super unique. Did you continue playing any sports? In college, when you're at uh, the University I did. of I Iowa, I played at uh, University of Iowa. I played baseball. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I was looking at your background. It looks like you did a stint at uh, Loyola Chicago, I believe, right? Yep. Yeah, I got my MBA at Loyola Chicago while working at Arthur J. Gallagher. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. That's actually a point of commonality between us. I went to Loyola Marymount University in L.A. So, oh, cool. Both Jesuit schools. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I, your scenery was probably a little better than mine. <laughs> but you know what? Your basketball team uh, is probably yeah. a little bit better, better than ours, at least in the last few years. Yeah. Porter Mosier was a locker partner of mine. He was the head coach at Loyola. Just coincidentally, um, he was a friend and now he's down at Oklahoma, uh, head basketball coach down there. Okay. He's doing great stuff. Yeah. All right. Very cool. We're, we're very hopeful for the LMU Lions that we have a new coach, Stan Johnson, we're raising the standard is what we call yeah, it at, yeah, at yeah. LMU. But at least Gonzaga in our league is, is getting some serious attention. So 
hopefully that benefits the rest of the pack. Yeah, it lifts everybody up, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, Dan, when you were growing up, was there any advice that your parents gave you, maybe growing up in a bigger family, um, any learning experiences you had that you think influenced the rest of your career or, you know, um, the, the trajectory of your career? You know, I think that um, my dad was in sales, led sales teams and, you know, had opportunities to move. He was in the semiconductor industry where back in the 70s and 80s when chips were getting embedded in, you know, tech and it's a pretty uh, hot area. And he had a, several opportunities to go out to California and chose not to do that. So one lesson, you know, kind of I learned was just listening to him and all these sales stories is kind of how I came to love business and all things business. And so that was kind of like my MBA when I was a little kid and just found out that I wanted to be competitive in business and I wanted to make a lot of money and wanted to be successful. And I think all of that came from just kind of listening to some of his stories and things to do and things not to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, several great examples there. And then, you know, when it came down to leaving the Chicago area, kind of, you know, I wanted to start my own company and kind of control my own destiny, so to speak. And to do that, I had to move to Des Moines, Iowa, the company that I was uh, going to partner starting the business that I started called Innovative Captive Strategies was uh, really partnering with Holmes Murphy mm -hmm. uh, back in the day. And I had to leave you know, Chicago area where I never thought I'd leave Arthur J. Gallagher, never thought I'd leave Chicago, you know, you know, identified kind of with the bulls and the cubs and all that. And yeah. I just, you know, um, but, you know, I, I looked at my dad's experience where, you know, he always thought, you know, maybe look back and said, well, maybe should I have moved, you know, and I didn't want to be in that position. So, you know, I, I ended up making the move and I, figured if I can't move to Iowa where I went to school, I, you know, I really don't want to own a company or, you know, start something and build something. So, um, I'm glad I did. It was a great decision and it's worked out uh, really well for, for our family and everything. So. Okay. Okay. You went from university of Iowa to working for Gallagher while you Correct. were getting your master's at yep. Loyola Chicago. Yeah. What caused you, because it sounds like you're describing something really similar to what I went through when I started in the insurance industry. I started in a training program at ACE and I really wanted to control my own destiny. And um, yeah. my brother was in a similar position at the company he was at. We, you know, Evolve became our idea where we could um, really uh, be the masters of, of what we were, we were doing. What drew you to the captive space and what made you so confident in uh, jumping away from Arthur J. Gallagher and starting your own business? So a captive really is kind of the anti-insurance, right? I was uncomfortable um, being in the insurance business and being classified as an insurance professional. Cause and that was young in my career. I didn't know what I didn't know, but at the time I was, you know, when you think of insurance, you're thinking of life insurance or maybe personal lines or something that's not as professional as, you know, commercial insurance and, and things like that. So when I learned about captives, it was really helping clients own their own risk and set up their own reinsurance companies. And I just, and it was more financial and very numbers driven. And it's something that I identified with. And I, I, I like the alternative mindset of, of captives and alternative risks solutions and, um, I like the financial side of, you know, giving clients opportunities to get uh, rewards back for their hard work and for being safe and things like that. And, um, you know, what it turned out was I was selling controlling your destiny to clients. And next thing you know, uh, it, it, it was one of those things that struck a chord with me and said, you know, why do I want to work forever for somebody else when really I want to control my own destiny? And, you know, some of that all led to putting seeds in my own head around becoming an owner of a company and, and kind of moving down that path. Innovative captive strategies, were they like an exclusive captive creator for Holmes Murphy clients or how did that, how does that relationship work? Yeah. So when I, when I left the third largest at the time, I think Gallagher was to go to maybe the, maybe the top 50, broker at the time in Holmes Murphy, everyone thought I was crazy. Like you're going to Des Moines, Iowa to do what, you know, with who mm -hmm. and, you know, but Holmes Murphy had 
you know, a great leadership team, great values, and they wanted to grow and they wanted to grow by providing solutions, you know, to their clients that they thought was in their client's best interest. And, you know, that's where, you know, I was probably young enough back to your earlier question around how do you, how did you know when you started Evolve, how did you know, right? Mm-hmm. You, you didn't, you just had belief and conviction that you'd figured out. And I think I had enough, you know, belief and conviction and, and you know, I knew what I knew. I didn't really know what I didn't know, but I figured, you know what, I'm confident enough to try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Um, I had great relationships and I had great mentors that got me to a certain place that it gave me the confidence that if I took that next step, I could um, be successful. And I felt like there was a network around that, you know, within the reinsurance space, within the brokerage community, but, you know, that I could, you know, tap into to help me, you know, be successful if needed. So, um, you know, Holmes Murphy wanted to get in the alternative risk business and want to get into captives. And I just made it clear to them up front that the size of their firm at the time would not be big enough to be to create a separate company to be successful in the alternative marketplace. So we knew early on that we'd have to have a business model that created an opportunities for to partner with other agencies across the country that we could then help them just like we were helping Holmes Murphy at the time. And so that's where, you know, they bought into that idea and that concept. That's why we had a separate brand and innovative captive strategies. And that's why it wasn't called, you know, Holmes Murphy Captive Services, so to speak. Right. So um, that separate branding strategy and separate business strategy allowed us to, you know, help Holmes Murphy and be successful and penetrate their clients, but also help other agencies as well. Yeah. I forgot to ask you, Dan, when you were coming out of college and you're trying to figure out where you're going to work and you ended up at Gallagher. Uh, did you know you wanted to be in the insurance industry or? No, no, no. no okay. No, no. Uh, you know, my dad's cousin worked at Gallagher, Jim Keogh, and he was uh, kind enough to make an introduction and kind enough to give me an opportunity. Um, so I got an internship there, went through the internship, got an offer, you know, and, uh, you know, again, when you're when you're young and you have a lot to learn, you don't really know business. You know, I wasn't convinced, you know, Insurance was for me, but I liked Arthur J. Gallagher. The company was and is a great company. They've got great leadership and great values. Um, but, you know, and my mentor actually just ironically is uh, retiring. Uh, my old mentor, Kevin Doyle, is retiring at the end of the year. But, you know, great people, right? And the industry is full of great people, and I'm a people person. So when I learn more about, you know, the industry and the people and the relationships that are, make you know, that help make sure you're – successful. I mean, it was turned out to be a great decision for me to kind of give it a chance. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity through Jim Keogh and Kevin Doyle and others that gave me that early opportunity and captives. And it's been, it's been a good ride. It's been fun. Dan, how did you get connected with Kevin Doyle? Um, I'm curious because I think there's a lot of time, a lot of times it's just, it's almost like a natural connection with a mentor for one reason or another. But I think a lot of folks in the insurance industry are, are also looking to seek out mentors. How did you connect yeah. with Kevin initially? You know, it, again, it was like that. I think it was a reporting thing early on and Kevin was involved in captives. And I, when I started at Gallagher, I was the only producer in the brokerage business at the time that focused in exclusively on selling captives. So if you didn't buy a captive, I didn't try to sell you a retro or a large deductible or some other traditional insurance policy. I was purely on the side of, I wanted to be an expert Mm -hmm. and I wanted to be pure and I wanted to be, you know, all things captives. And, and so Kevin, you know, was, was doing that at the time. And then we ultimately built Gallagher Cap Services, which then, you know, Jennifer Gallagher, uh, you know, and, and David McManus and Peter Mullen helped startup Artex, who I went over and, and helped them start basically an offshore reinsurance company that sold U.S. products in the alternative risk business. So it was very much now that brand is all connected. Um, and um, so, the, you know, I think some of that, when you get to mentoring, you get lucky. And I think I got lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do, I, I think mentors, you know, as you know, mentors are vital to individual success. So I think it's a case by case basis, whether you find them, whether you're assigned to them or you get lucky, 
either which way, you know, I think you can learn from all of them, but you don't know which ones are going to be the ones that stick that really propel you forward. And I think you just got to keep, keep looking to find that, that network of mentors that will help you. Yeah, I agree with you. And I took a similar path of finding an area where I could specialize, where I knew I could be the primary point of contact and and really bring the most value Uh, for me specifically when it comes to cyber insurance. Um, Yeah. And I, I kind of had a similar learning experience with my dad because I saw him. He was a, a retail broker um, and recently sold his agency to Hub. But he was a generalist for a long time, and he really I saw him see success when yeah. he started to specialize. Okay, so you are um, you start this this captive company, and then um, you transition to working with Holmes Murphy and climbing the ranks in in Holmes Murphy. Tell me about that process. So Holmes Murphy is a, a private independent firm and, you know, their intention is to stay private, right? So, you know, we, we believe that, you know, private ownership allows opportunities for individuals like me and you and others that, you know, public firms may, may not offer and do it in a way that maybe allows you to have controlling your destiny and your fate a little bit more and allows you maybe to center in on the client and focus in on clients and focus in on kind of their unique potential and ultimately focus in on the people that make all that happen, which are your employees. So, you know, we have a value set around here around being privately held and just centering everything in around our client and our people that make our clients successful, you know, and, and is that, that's as a backdrop. And so when you look at, you know, the transition into that was some of that was just succession planning. Mm -hmm. So I had an opportunity to take on more things early on. I was in charge of marketing and and then took on, you know, some other things in the kind of corporate services area. And then that just afforded me more opportunities to succeed our last CEO, Jim Swift in uh, chairman and CEO. And I, I I took that over and I think it was 2012. If you're looking at your, your journey to become the, the CEO of Holmes Murphy, um, Obviously, you had to be successful on the way up. If you were to look back, is there anything that you would credit your success to, whether it was um, a specific, maybe a personality trait, uh, work ethic, or habits, or um, you know, were you in the right place at the right time? Is there anything you look back on and you're like, you know what, I can point to these three things that really helped propel my success? You know, I think when I... So I'll, I'll go back and I'll answer it a little bit differently. But, you know, we, we have dealt with uh, individual psychologists over the years. And, and you know, there's an intersection of three things. You have to have character, competency, and you, you've got to fit the culture of the company. And so I think that if you look at the success that, you know, any one of our leaders have had, maybe even in, in our company, I think maybe even in your company, right? I mean, you you have to have, you know, individual character that you know who you are and what you stand for. And, you know, that has to line up with the company that you're working with, right? Mm -hmm. From a competency standpoint, you have to be good. There's no, I mean, there's no substitute for people that have skills that don't work, right? But there's, if you have skills that you work and you work hard and you apply them and you have a certain level of competency that leads to success, that's obviously you know, great. And and then the last is the culture of the company that, you know, you work in is that allow you to be your best self. And, you know, we spend a lot of time around here thinking about how we can help our people be their best versions of their best self. And what could we do to help them reach their unique potential? And I, I think if we do that and we grow our people and we grow their opportunities to be successful for themselves and, and in life, then my guess is we're going to get the best out of them serving our clients. And so that's how we think about it here. So, you know, if you think about going back in time, my guess is in those three buckets, I, you know, was fortunate enough to have people help support me, be successful along that journey. And, you know, hard work never hurts and luck never hurts either. So mm-hmm. all of those things converge into uh, kind of where I, I think I am at today. Obviously, you're responsible for the strategic vision for Holmes Murphy as the CEO. What does a typical day look like for Dan Keo? Um, It depends on the day, right? So I, I, it's just as a personal preference, I try to keep scheduled open time. I don't like from seven to five or whatever. 
I don't do, I don't do meetings straight through the day. I try to have a, a pretty flexible schedule because you never know what is going to come at you during the day. Um, and, and I think what we try to do is make sure everything's highest and best use. So, you know, you're not spent, you're not meetings to say you're busy and you're in a meeting. Um, and then you got to make an impact, whether it's the individual people that you meet each day or the meetings that you are in or the meetings that you should be planning or, or scheduling out. Um, so, the, you know, I would break my time into to executive level kind of decisions and executive level time then kind of in the business with people and, and partners to either help understand where our team members are at and have them kind of sort out what they're working through client connections, community, you know, those are kind of the buckets that, that would consume kind of my time. Do you have any habits or daily rituals that you make sure you do every day? Well, I get up and work out every day. So, I mean, that would be my, you know, get, get my head in the right spot, get, you know, get, it's nothing like good sweat to have you have some clarity. Um, so I would say that that would be the one thing that I do kind of every morning. And like when you say that, I, I feel like it, it um, sounds like something that is, you know, not crazy complex, but um, most people don't. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? Most people don't. And uh, I, I am totally with you. I actually, I recently read a book called The 5 a.m. Club. And uh, it starts, yeah. uh, talks about starting your day off with like a 20 minute workout. And I've just found combining that with um, coffee in the morning is like the, the, Mental yeah. clarity I have from doing yeah. that is crazy compared to the days when I don't do it. I'm like, I feel like I'm just in slow motion in a fog when I don't yeah. work out. No, I, I agree with you. I think the, the, you, 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 you one up me on the coffee. Cause I, I think you're right. I mean, I hit the coffee <laughs> after and mm -hmm. it, it's a definite accelerator for a good day. So. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, I think that's a great, uh, point to transition on to talk about Holmes Murphy today. How would you describe the Holmes Murphy culture right now? Uh, electric, um, energetic, um, healthy, um, you know, purposeful. Um, you know, those are some words that maybe that come to, mo to mind. And how, how do you go about building company culture um, and making sure that that company culture is felt by all the employees within the organization. Well, I think everyone has to understand where you're going, right? So it goes back to common vision and clarity around, okay, where are we and where we're going? I think there's got to be some casting of vision and casting in, in people. It's got to be, it's got to connect with people. So, mm -hmm. you know, my division, my role, you know, my daily work. And I think that there's opportunities for us in that category, but I would tell you successful businesses and, you know, where I feel we're pretty good at is our leaders know where we're going. They know how to communicate that. They know how to support that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, as we grow, um, you know, and, and as we learn how to be connected in a disconnected world and, you know, certainly connected flex is a real term and people working remotely is real and all of those things. It's, it's easier to be, you know, connected when everyone's in the same building, you know, we have 14 or 15 offices, you know, around the country, one in Cayman islands, you know, we have remote workers for sure. And, you know, cascading information consistently so people can see it, they can feel it, they can resonate with them, they can connect to it. You know, those are all things that are accretive. Uh, we do at Holmes Murphy, um, you know, a video team check-in, I think it's once every other week now, where we just share kind of how we're doing important topics and we cascade that out just so people know, you know, what, you know, what's going on outside of their little world or outside their team or outside their division. And I think that's been really helpful. I think, you know, we send out, you know, we monthly information about the performance of the company to our shareholders, you know, so they have visibility into how we're doing. So there's opportunities there for financial transparency, um, and then I would say that we do twice a year kind of road shows where we connect with our teams in their markets where they are and kind of meet them where they are and then kind of share kind of where we are as a company and connect it to the local market. It's interesting with the pandemic occurring 
And I, cause I, I kind of experienced what you're describing with having everyone in an office versus not being in an office. And especially for a sales culture to have people come in where it's, you know, a fun, exciting, competitive environment. Yeah. It's just, it's takes things to another level than when someone's just kind of sitting at their house and they're, you know, only interacting with people on a very professional, mostly, yeah. um, you know, non-verbal, just completely written basis. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's great. Most producers want to be around other people, right? I mean, yeah. they get, and if you're a people person, you get energy when you're around other people. And I think a lot of our employees that, you know, have gotten comfortable not coming into work when they do come in, they for they're like, like a muscle in their brain or something gets triggered. Well, like they're, they're like, Oh my gosh, I, I, I forgot how much I enjoy this. You know, uh-huh. Uh-huh. So you're, if you could just get them to change their habits just one time, it's easier to get them in and the second or third time just because they forgot how much they really need it and, and enjoy it. It changes your whole day. And I got to tell yeah. you, Dan, I, I've heard some really cool things about Holmes Murphy in terms of, uh, you know, having dogs at the office, having beer on tap, um, yeah. a lot of volunteering opportunities. Um, I've also heard it's very, very encouraging, uh, like a, a very encouraging environment for newer or younger or um, maybe lower level employees to bring ideas to the yeah. top that could have influence. Well, that makes me feel good. I mean, that's our goal, <laughs> right? I mean, you uh-huh. you want to have people feel welcome, right? And and that's not just as they walk in the front door. It's whether they're in a meeting and they're welcome to participate and they're welcome to throw out their ideas because candidly, you never know where the, be- the next best idea is going to come from. And I think, you know, it would be, you know, one of arrogance not to listen to all ideas. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, want all of your employees feel like they're, they're it's a safe place where they can yep. throw out ideas. And, you know, I always tell them that I'm the biggest ideation person ever. And most of my ideas are like horrible, but at least I feel comfortable sharing and hopefully I'm setting a good example where they feel safe as well. So, um, you know, but, you know, in terms of the environment, our environment does support our culture. I mean, we have an open and transparent kind of workspace, we have an open and transparent leadership team. You know, we we want to make sure that you know there's 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 opportunities for everybody to there's no there's not a lot of hierarchy in terms of approachability of leaders or you know benefits to some not all. You know, we try to make sure that everybody has the same opportunity for success at Holmes Murphy, and we take that seriously. I've heard about some really pr- cool programs, and I don't know the full details on them, but I heard about one called the homies program. And I've heard about the brainery. Okay. Can you, can you provide a little bit more context on those two things? Yeah. So, um, you know, homies, you know, what up homes is, you know, just kind of that. And then brainery is all around young, young talent or, you know, people that come into our organization that really don't know anything about insurance and how do we connect them to other people around the industry or around the, the company and then train them in a fun and enter engaging way. So, you know, the internship is a great, we do, we've had a internship for over 50 years. It's been really successful. A lot of our executive committee members and former uh, CEOs have been interns. So that's we're something we're really proud of. Brainery is the next step for those that when they graduate, they get in the, the brainery. Um, and then we just introduced HMA Soul, which is a program for, you know, in, uh, individuals in our company, maybe year three to year seven, where, they're there, they understand now what they're in, whether it's division or industry or whatever it might be. And they're looking for where can this take me? Where else can I go? What opportunities are within this company that may, may be for me that I'm just not aware of? So the idea is that to engage them and make them aware of all the different business units and engage them on opportunities. You know, we do a lot of strength finders, a lot of uh, profiling. So we invest back in our people so they know who they are from a testing standpoint and they learn really about kind of what we believe their highest and best use is based on their testing. Mm-hmm. And then we allow them to explore things that are in their highest and best use. What test do you guys use? I'm curious because we, we've, we've used a couple internally, um, one called the culture index and another one called the Enneagram. We just had a company retreat where we, it was really interesting to see the results on and, and how, just reading my own results, how accurate they were um, in certain cases. So I'm curious which tests you guys use. 
Yeah. You know, I, I know we use strength finders as one, you know, okay. everybody has a little placard around there. And then on the other one, it's, I refer to it as a care profile, but I think it's not formally named the care profile. I think it used to be named care for profile and then they've evolved the name, but I'm not exactly sure what the modern name is. Okay. Okay, cool. If there was a new what, employee, what, what, go what, ahead. Do you, what are your, what do, what do you, when you get tested, what, what surprises you about your test results? Well, so we use the culture index. We had the culture index, uh, uh, Tony Quartaro, who is, um, an executive advisor at the culture next come in to talk to us about the program and we had to, to fill out the surveys. It takes probably 15 minutes and then you're literally just selecting adjectives about yeah. yourself. I didn't know how it was going to be when he came in, but he came in and our whole executive team did it. And it was literally like he was talking about people in the room that I had known some of them for my whole life. And yeah. he was talking about them like he knew every single detail about their past and it was just <laughs> shocking. It was shocking. And yeah. so th that, that one I've, I've really enjoyed using just because it's so easy to fill out that it allows you to essentially eliminate the majority of bad interviews or, or interviews with people that aren't necessarily close personality fits to a given role before you even know who they are. It just yeah. shows you uh, folks names that are close to their, um, close to the role and, and, um, how close that personality is to the ideal personality for that role that you've yeah. created in the system. That's a really interesting one. And then the other one is the Enneagram. Have you heard of that one? I have not. Okay. Enneagram was really interesting. We had an expert come out and do this for our company retreat and it's a little bit more intensive. Um, it takes, I want to say it takes 30 to 45 minutes to fill out. But that one was wild. That one, I was like, wow, this is really kind of hitting home. And it basically tells you uh, what number you are in, on a, it's like a scale of nine. And so I'm a three. And it just kind of really unveils like your, why you're motivated to do certain things. Um, and so if, if you're ever interested in that, I, I would recommend it. That's the most recent one I've taken. The other one I know that Philadelphia Insurance it was really important in the scaling of their business was the caliper yeah, test. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The caliper, we use the caliper reactively if we're on the fence about a candidate and we're not yeah. exactly sure what to do. I'd say the caliper, the coolest thing about that one, again, it's a little bit more of an intensive one. I think it takes about an hour to fill out, but it gives you a reasonable degree of insight into someone's intelligence, which culture index is not. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I, you know, how, how organizations think about, you know, testing for the right role and all mm -hmm. that. I mean, you know, I think for me, I'm less concerned about what they know. It's good to know who they are. Mm -hmm. And, and then it's important for all of us to know who we are individually. And then it's as a leader, what I love about that is knowing the personalities of the room mm -hmm. and how they're going to play with each other in the sandbox. Right. And so then when, when they learn about it, each other, you know, when you react a certain way based on your experiences, your, you know, your DNA, your, your personality profile, it, it's better for people to understand, well, that's, that's natural for you to react that way based on X, Y, and Z, you know, and you, you get, you can, you can build great team health that people really take time to understand each other. It, it is eye opening. And it's like, just, I, I can give you an example of my brother and I, and it's like his, his Enneagram is, he's an eight, which is the challenger. And it's like, it makes so much sense when you see someone else's profile <laughs> yeah. as to why they're reacting the way they're reacting about yeah. something specific. Now I get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like way off from what I was expecting because we just have different personalities, you know, and, and yeah putting the right team right. together with those personalities is, is kind of a fun thing once you understand how they interact. Yeah. My old boss, uh, did the, the where he just like, you know, read my personality, the e ESTJ or whatever the, mm -hmm. the words are on the profile. And we were the same except for one letter. Mm -hmm. And he's like, now I get it. Like <laughs> it drove me nuts that, you know, I'm late for things and I, my clock is not the best, but he's a, 
on uh-huh. time everywhere. Uh-huh. And we, on that one area, we were off. And he's like, now I get it. But now I know why you drive me crazy. <laughs> so. Yes. If you're ever interested in the Enneagram, it's it, like every, um, every personality profile shows how it interacts with any alternative personality yeah. profile. So I can see like, oh, my brother's an eight, I'm a three. This is how three and eights uh, work really well together. Here's where they're probably gonna clash. Yeah. And it, it's, it was surprisingly spot on. Good. So uh, yeah, that's been, that's been a fun um, part of uh, not only bringing candidates in, but also uh, managing our, our current team. One unique thing about Holmes Murphy is I believe the majority of it, or maybe the whole thing, is employee owned. Is that correct? So yeah, we're we are not an ESOP, but okay. you have to be to be an owner. You have to work at the company. So we are an employee owned company. Oh, cool, cool. When so when you join Holmes Murphy um, after you hit a certain milestone or a certain point, do you have the opportunity to yeah buy in? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you do, and so it's. For producers, it's black and white. So, you know, you know, if, if I work hard, I'm successful at this point, I have the opportunity. And then for um, everyone else, we just have, there's not a black and white, but there's just basic criteria that you have to to meet. And um, so, yeah, we, we're we proud of our employee ownership where, you know, we want to make sure that we provide opportunities for others and give them an opportunity to own if they're, you know, kind of difference makers and they they have that desire. So cool. Cool. That's, that's really unique for a, a lot of agencies that we work with and deal with. And so I just wanted to make sure that's highlighted well, for anyone that's listening. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I mean, it, it, what I think is unique is the fact that Holmes Murphy's the third largest insurance brokerage firm, you know, privately held. And so when you look at that, we're not family owned, you know, cause we don't have family in the business. Holmes and Murphy had an agreement where they would not bring their kids into business. And we've kept that uh, arrangement. So my kids, will not work at this company as long as, you know, as, as long as I'm here. And so we think that's not an nepotism rule for Holmes Murphy provides opportunities for folks like you or others that learn about Holmes Murphy, learn about how cool it is and know that they could come here and there's no, nothing holding them back, between, you know, around nepotism that would impede their ability to be successful or become an owner. So that's super um, unusual in the insurance business, particularly for a firm at the size and scale that we are. The other thing that's interesting about us is that when you look at kind of the weighted average shareholder age, which is a metric that uh, Reagan uh, Consulting out of Atlanta has kind of come up with and generated, which it's an indication of, you know, your ability to perpetuate if you chose to as a private firm. And basically above 55, you know, you got to start planning and you got to keep an eye on it. You know, we're we're at an all time low of 46 today. So, wow. you know, we're considered a very young, you know, firm and a very large firm that has a great one way in front of us for uh, the future of our company. Like you said, extremely unique for the insurance industry. Yeah. That is uh, plagued by nepotism. And, you know, like I, I, I uh, you know, my dad was, I'm, I'm fourth generation into the insurance industry. So, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. It is in the blood and we work with so many firms that are family run and, you know, just the whole concept of renewals, passing that down to the next, it's like, I see why it's in there. So it's, it's, I, I, that's very cool and very different from most agencies that we deal with. Yeah, no, and and not to say that, you know, having nepotism is bad, it's just not our way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there are great firms out there that we respect that, you know, the Gallagher's as an example are, you know, firms that have had success, Brown and Brown, had great success, you know, but it's largely a family started and supported deal. And then the names on the door and they, you know, they're, it's just not, that's just not our way. And so mm-hmm. you have to know, get back to the, my character, competency and culture. You have to know that that's our culture is a non family way. You, you're, if your competency is top tier, you know, that you have the unlimited potential to, to, to be a part of a fast growing, you know, company that has great ownership model. Yep. And that that's clear coming in is, um, well, one interesting, exciting new thing I think that you guys have been uh, focused on is broker tech ventures. Can you tell me about broker tech ventures? 
Yeah, no, it's it's fun. You know, we started Broker Tech, you know, kind of after a whiteboard exercise here um, in in May of, you know, the idea, I think it was May of um, two years ago, uh, 2019. And, you know, Mike Victorson at M3, so get back to collaborators and, and, and people that we respect in the industry, Mike's firm, M3, similar to our firm where there's not, there's no, there's not an nepotism, um, uh, there's a policy there as well. And so Mike huh. had this great idea about trying to build a, something that would make a difference in the insure tech movement in the industry. And, and, and he wanted to start a fund and we agreed that we would help support that, you know, as the road kind of rolled out, Mike's firm and others were not able to raise in, the capital needed for the initiative. And so after um, getting educated on an accelerator and some other things, I called Mike and said, hey, we at Holmes Murphy want to go start an accelerator and we're going to go do this. We'll still support your venture, but we're going to go do this separate thing. Um, and after we thought about it, it would be better if we had more than just Holmes Murphy involved in it because the tech companies want to have a bigger scale and bigger distribution. And so I asked Mike, you know, would you have an interest in being a part of it? And he's like, yeah. You know, and I'm like, well, we love your name. What are you doing with the name? He's like, I'll give you the name. You know, so he seeded the name to us. I asked Mike if he wanted to be the co-CEO mm -hmm. of this company that we were starting. And, you know, that's kind of got, got us off the ground. And then after that, we called some friends of ours around the industry that were owners and leaders of these, some of the best, you know, mo most well-respected firms in the industry and invited them to be a part of the BTV uh, broker tech ventures uh, company that we were starting. That's extremely exciting. Um, I, I mean, tech is integrating into the insurance world quicker and quicker, and it is intimidating to, uh, you know, for example, go to uh, ITC or, you know, yeah. uh, whatever tech event um, for the insurance industry because it's so murky and there's so many people trying to get into it and it's so hard to see the value. And we've even had experience with certain vendors where, you know, we started working with them and they sold to, you know, the applieds of the world. And it was like, you know, how many people are in this game to, to truly provide meaningful value and scale and figure out what the right solution is. So, I, I mean, it seems like a really interesting idea to identify tech entrepreneurs that will um, truly enhance the, the insurance brokerage process. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, from being in the industry, you know, change should come from within, right? You know, we should be the ones, you know, ideating and seeing the problems that need to be solved and engaging tech to help solve those problems. I mean, if you look at Generation One with Zenefits coming in from the outside saying, hey, brokers don't add any value, they're lazy, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, we can get it done cheaper without them. And, you know, then they kind of had ran into some problems, right? And, you know, that was the first outside in movement. And, you know, we looked at it, we're like, you know, we got to lean in. We got to, you know, our company and Holmes Murphy, we like to engage. We like to engage fully into opportunities that we think could be game changers or difference makers for our clients or our people. And, you know, we, we engaged in this opportunity. We got the great distribution of, of agency partners, great distribution of insurance companies. And we have a roadmap that, you know, invited these great tech entrepreneurs to be a part of our cohort. And we've had two great cohorts, you know, and we've got a five tower business that has, you know, propelled companies forward in terms of wider distribution and scale. You know, we've raised capital for uh, some of these companies and, and done follow along investments for others. And, you know, we've created, you know, great partnerships. You know, we have a partnership with ITC where their agency connect platform really wasn't hitting the mark on the agency voice and agency topics that would be of interesting of interest to the to the community and so we took it over and um you know have had great success now it's called broker tech ventures or Bro broker tech connect which is kind of that part of the um the, the platform there that jay and caribou started so we're collaborators that way the other thing is we stood up an accelerator in israel so we've got partner wow. in israel and code kobe Bendelak and you know, we've got, we've funded four companies there and um, in our first cohort and, and again, have had great success in Israel. We've got another partnership starting up in Latin America 
with Hilario and team, uh, Pablo and, and building that out. So, you know, the goal for broker tech is to have a worldwide lens on capability is that we think we can propel forward faster and give intellectual capital, relationship capital, financial capital, um, and then, you know, help them be successful. I mean, so, you know, I think, you know, we've done a, a, an effective job in the first two cohorts in the first couple of years, but I think our best is yet to come. That's really impressive. I haven't, I haven't spoken to a, a CEO of an insurance agency that uh, has been more invested in technology, especially globally uh, from what you're describing. Uh, so it's really cool. And I think that kind of speaks to my next question, which is what, this is a super general question, but what do you see as the future for Holmes Murphy? Yeah. I mean, I think Holmes Murphy's on a path to, you know, continue to grow and evolve. And, and, you know, we have a long runway. The great thing about being private is you set your own course and you set your own time frame, And so you can control a lot of things under your control. And obviously you can't control what you can't control, whether it's healthcare reform or technology that you're not aware of things like that. But I, I think if you get the right people with the right mindset, you'll be able to, you know, um, certainly solve challenges that come your way and even capitalize on, them, you know, so, we have tremendous confidence in our leaders. We have tremendous confidence in our team, uh, our teams that serve our clients, and we've got great relationships with clients. We know which clients want to be first ones to be engaged on new technology. We got we have others that, that we know don't they don't want to be the, uh, the the guinea pig. They want to be when it's baked and it's right for them at that time. So it's an, it's a really dynamic time to be in the insurance industry, and and we are really excited that we're you know, privately held at the size and scale that we are, you know, we feel it gives us so many advantages. Do we want to get bigger? Yes, we're going to get bigger. Do we want to, you know, widen out our reach? Yes, we want to right now. Do we want to go faster? Yes. But those are all things that are just, you know, because of that, we're, we're highly competitive and we want to win in the marketplace. But, you know, how we do it is more important than what we do. You know, we want to make sure that we are, are good, good, good team members, good partners to our stakeholders, the communities and other agencies and insurance companies that we partner with. And if we do that and we set the right example, I think that we'll be in uh, great shape in the future. That's a great answer. Uh, and, and while I have you, Dan, is there any uh, final notes that you want to get out there to the audience, audience of insurance professionals, or are there any guests that you think we should have on that you think would provide value to that audience of U.S. insurance professionals that could be listening? You know, I, I, I like going to sages, right? I mean, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of people that have kind of been there and done that, and they have a great perspective to give you confidence in what may come in the future and what they've seen in the past. And, you know, obviously, Pat Ryan is, is, is the top of the chain on that. Uh, Phil Harvey is another gentleman that is, 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 is a brilliant man and has done, you know, tremendous things. Um, you know, Mike Tigwad and it, it, Connor Strong is, you know, somebody that, you know, yeah, he's, he's a great friend and, and great leader there. Um, you know, you know, I think what we're trying to do in Iowa is, is you know, with Terry Vaughn, who's the, you know, uh, she's been former commissioner of insurance here in the state involved with Drake in their business school. And then now is getting, connected back to her father's uh, Vaughn Institute at the University of Iowa. You know, if you look at Iowa on the map, I mean, th the fact is we are the center of the universe for insurance, right? And so the regulations and the ecosystem here and with the capital and the startup uh, stuff that we've got going with the Global Insurance Accelerator, which was the first accelerator um, that was stood up in the industry. Um, and then the second uh, one that uh, we are our first, which the uh, Broker Tech Ventures was the first one that was stood up for the broker community. And so when you think about the ecosystem that we've got here and we're starting our, our fund here, Mike's original idea that we're coming back around, we're starting a, a, a fund around $100 million fund here in the next you know couple of weeks to fund these capabilities and help them accelerate moving forward. So, you know, I think I was a great story. I think it's, uh, it's some of the names I gave you are great names for, for folks that might make uh, good guess. Um, and I think, you know, I think going the sage route, uh, would be a, a good one, whether it's Terry yeah. Vaughn or the other individuals that I mentioned. Seriously, I really appreciate the insight and, uh, the recommendations. Um, and, and we'll do some digging to see if we can make that happen. Um, 
But I know I have taken up a lot of your time. The final thing that we like to end with um, in these conversations is, is five rapid fire questions that uh, we've put together from the audience. And so I am ready to dive into those if you are and you can answer them as short or as long as you want. All right. Sounds good. Okay. First question. <laughs> did you ever participate in the wave at the University of Iowa? 100%. Or afterwards. Yeah. 100%. Can you can, can you actually break that down for people? Because I just learned about it, and that's one of the coolest things I think that I, I the coolest traditions I've seen in college football. Yeah. So there's a, a children's hospital that's built right on the other side of the stadium that towers over the stadium, and the kids get to go up to the top floor and look down at the game, which is kind of one of the reasons why it's built to the height it is. And at the end of the first quarter everyone takes time to wave to the kids that are watching the game. And it's been a real, really cool way for everyone to kind of pause in a really highly competitive environment to really reflect on really what matters, right? So health and well-being of individuals and these kids are sick and cancer's real. I mean, the game's a game. So you got to keep everything in perspective. And it's a great opportunity at that time just to remind ourselves that this is just a game. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. I'm, I'm I'm glad we could highlight that. That's that's really cool that you've uh, participated, and I would love to uh, get to a game at some point. Yeah, well, I, if you uh, if you ever make it this way, let me know. I'll get I'll get you to a game. I got tickets. All right, I I might take you up on that. I will hey, definitely let you know. Yeah, anytime, anytime. Open invitation. Okay, okay, cool. So, Dan, I know uh, it sounds like you are going into uh, the headquarters on a daily basis. The second question is. Do you have a favorite Holmes Murphy office to visit outside of uh, the one that you go in day in and day out? You know, I don't. I, I like them all. I mean, I get <laughs> energy by being around our people. And if our uh -huh. people are there and we've got great office space. So like our, our cool office vibe that you're hearing of is not limited to you know Des Moines or Waukee. You mm -hmm. know, if you walked into Dallas or Minneapolis or Denver, or Kansas City, Omaha, I mean, the list goes on. They're all really great offices. And what makes them great is our people. Mm -hmm. And so when you get a chance to go in and connect with our people, the space just, you know, kind of complements the great energy that that's there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've only heard positive things about every single Holmes Murphy space that I know uh, one of our evolved team members has visited. They have always been very impressed. And so it's, cool. a, it's a great example for us. Well, we'll have to get you to one of these, one of the, one of the locations. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, question number three. Uh, what is the best restaurant in Dallas County? Wow, good question. You know, um, I like sushi. So there's a, a place called Wasabi, which is a, a sushi place, which is really, really good. Um, okay. So I, I, I think I'd, I'd go with that one. All right, all right. Good to know, good to know. I, I, I uh wouldn't expect that in Iowa, but that is, uh, that's very interesting. We're debunking um, all these myths that you have, right? I know. I know. It's great. Um, okay. Just a couple more. Second, last question. What is your favorite book? So I'm an avid reader. Um, you know, oh my gosh, my favorite book. You know, I read Who Not How in the last probably year or so. It was a recommendation from my uh, client. And, I, you know, I don't know if it's my favorite book, but I, I found myself re reading it over and over again. So I've read it maybe five or six times now. Okay. And I, 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 I share books with our leadership team and our voting shareholders, and we have book reads and kind of stuff like that. And so Who Not How, for me, is a book around kind of just re reminding everybody it's it's the who's in your life that make the difference. It's not the what you do. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a good book. It's a good business book. It's a good reminder for folks. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, Who Not How. I'll, I'll have to check it out. Who's the author on that one? Dan Sullivan. And okay. there's another guy. But if you do get Dan Sullivan, Who Not How, and there's a book there, I can pull it up real quick if you want. Yes, that would be great. I'm reading Think Like a Monk now. Okay, okay. I think who, that, who wrote Think Like a Monk? Was that Robin Sharma? 
Uh, let me just say Jay Shetty. Oh, Jay Shetty. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I haven't read that one, but I have. I, someone else just recently referenced that for me. So that's, that's a, a great shout out as well. Okay, cool. Final question. And Dr. Benjamin Hardy was the other gentleman. Dan Sullivan, Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Okay. Final question. What are you most excited for in 2022? And it can be personal or professional. Um, so I would probably say I, so I, I'm excited for the ability to travel more freely. Um, so we've got partners in Israel that have invited us over, uh, to, uh, Tel Aviv. So I'm excited to take, uh, Ellen Willison, our chief innovation officer, Susan Hatton, our chief operating officer for Broker Tech Ventures and, and head uh-huh. over to uh, Tel Aviv and, um, you know, return the visit that, Jay and, or uh, I'm sorry that um, Kobe and their team came over here recently. So I want to do that. Um, That's one of my epic. best friends, my best friends owns a Parma soccer in, in Parma, Italy. And um, I've been to some games without fans and I'm excited to go to a game with fans. So I'm really cool. Super excited about that. Um, my son, Daniel, um, is, uh, in a, he's in uh, first year of law school. He applied for a, an in, uh, a study abroad certificate uh, opportunity in Nantes, uh, France. And okay. so my hope is that he is there and I'm going to go visit him um, in, in this summer. And so, yeah, I love yeah. life experiences and I like to travel and I like to spend time with family and friends. So that is a phenomenal answer. I am also very excited for, for travel to open up here. And I know, I haven't been been able to visit our partners over at Lloyd's of London in a long time and they haven't really been able to get out here. So I'm excited to get out to London. I feel like when I do, it's like, man, if I can try and take yeah, it. Yeah, London's a great sort of, city. L- yeah. You know, yeah, so I'm all in on London. So. Yeah, yeah. And then when you're over there, it's like, you know, jumping from city to city while you're over there just to make it all worth it is something yeah. I think is is totally uh, worthwhile. So, um, well, Dan, thank you again. I really appreciate it. I think uh, there's going to be a lot of folks that are really interested in learning to get to know more about you and your vision for Holmes Murphy. And clearly you are heavily invested in the future of the industry. And Holmes Murphy is uniquely positioned within the industry for success. So you guys have been a great role model for uh, myself and my brother as we uh, continue to grow our own business. And so if there's anything you ever need, don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, you too. And if there's anything you need, feel free. You know, we're happy to help any way we can. Sounds great, Dan. Well, with that said, I will uh, talk to you soon. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Varuna. Varuna is the agency management system of the future built on the number one customer relationship management tool in the world, Salesforce. Varuna allows you to customize your system, workflows, reports, and dashboards in minutes and allows you to gain actionable insights about your business in real time letting you use this intelligence to grow your business in multiples. Varuna allows you to know your business so that you can grow your business. Please visit varuna.com to learn more.